Worldwide, by early May, at least three and a half million COVID-19 infections had been recorded. The real number is expected to be much higher, a global contagion that's taken less than four months. Our schools, workplaces and societies have been put on hold. Economies have plummeted, uncertainty and confusion have taken grip, whilst we're flooded with conflicting information. For many of us, a visit to a coronavirus tracker has become a daily task as we grapple with the numbers and graphs to understand this novel virus. But what numbers do we need to know to get a handle on coronavirus? What can they tell us about our susceptibility or our progress? And how messy are the numbers that we use to measure this pandemic? Numbers are mesmerising because they appear to reveal patterns almost straight away. Those patterns are actually extremely informative. In some ways, they are one of our principal tools in trying to understand how the disease is spreading, the basic mechanisms by which it infects and transmits. So numbers, or rather the patterns therein, can be extremely informative. But what we need to have are the tools to interpret them. Let's familiarise ourselves with the fundamentals. Diseases have what's called a basic reproduction number, which is used to describe how contagious a disease is. Represented by the R0 sign, it shows how many other people are likely to be infected by one person carrying the disease. The flu has a basic reproduction number of around 1.3, which means that each person with the flu gets around one to two other people sick. COVID-19 is thought to have a basic reproduction number of around 2 to 2.5. This means that each person that gets COVID-19 will infect around 2 to 3 other people. Conversely, diseases also have an effective reproduction number, an RE, which represents the number of people in a population who can be infected by an individual at any given time. The number falls as people become immunised, either through immunisation or vaccination as well as when people pass away. Our behaviour can also reduce this number, such as social distancing guidelines. At the start of the pandemic in the UK, they were thinking that that R value was up at like three, which means that you've got one person, that's then spreading to three people, that's then spreading to nine people, and that's when you've got your exponential growth. And that is a problem. If you leave that unchecked, then obviously you can see that the nature of exponential growth means that within two weeks, you know, that's hitting so many more people. They now think they've got that down to about like 0.7, which means one person is infecting on average fewer than one person. That's then the number of cases starting to go down. Whilst lockdown and social distancing measures are in place, the government looks at the rate of spread in a community, and as we flatten the curve, the effective reproduction number should decrease. The aim is to get that number as low as possible, meaning that once the lockdown measures have the desired effect, for each person infected, on average less than one other person will get sick. A problem with this is that people who catch COVID-19 may present mild symptoms, or the virus may still be incubating within the host, making it difficult for a person to tell if they're contagious or that they have the disease at all. An incubation period is how long a disease is present within a host before they start showing or becoming aware of symptoms. The incubation period for COVID-19 can be up to 14 days. This means a host can have COVID-19 for up to two weeks before they present symptoms and before they're aware that they're contagious. There are many diseases where you transmit before you actually get ill. In fact, I would say that applies to a majority of successful pathogens because obviously once you're ill, you tend to be incapacitated. So it is not a surprise that many pathogens have evolved to transmit before that sort of clinical phase of infection. The flu, which COVID-19 is most often compared to, has an incubation period of around two days. This means that a host will often become aware that they're contagious very quickly and can therefore take measures to prevent others being infected much sooner. In the early stages of this pandemic, we were thinking maybe COVID-19 is not that much more serious than flu. But we know that on an average year, 
flu would kill about 250,000, 300,000 people. That's the mortality that's already occurred from COVID-19. If flu only kills about 250,000, 300,000 people a year on average, but COVID-19's already hit that and still going to go further and further and further, then we can really see how much more dangerous COVID-19 is. COVID-19's incubation period is more comparable to that of other highly infectious diseases, such as measles, whose incubation period is between 10 and 12 days. Ebola incubates between 2 and 21 days, while Zika is estimated to incubate between 3 and 14 days. While not all diseases are contagious during their incubation periods, it's been found that COVID-19 is contagious before symptoms are present and noticeable. This means that COVID-19 has more than seven times the length of time when compared to the flu, where a host is able to infect other people, in addition to being a more contagious disease. We know that some people can develop contagiousness before they develop symptoms, but it is not really clear how long that delay might be. There can be people who are infectious, but going about their normal lives because they haven't really realized that they've been infected. They don't know that they're contagious. And so by doing their normal activities, they can then pass on infection to other people. Diseases where someone is infected, is, is manifest, is, is easily perceived, are ones where you can very, uh, or more easily, apply a strategy whereby you trace and isolate every case and then their contacts where that becomes possible. The fact that you can't with this virus means that that sort of strategy is very difficult to implement. This is what makes this such a dangerous outbreak compared to others in the past. SARS, for example, was a highly infectious coronavirus. It had an R0 of 2 to 5, and it had similarities to COVID-19, but with a typical incubation period of 2 to 7 days. People often presented symptoms early, which helped combat the outbreak quickly. A host is only able to infect people that aren't immune to the disease that they carry. If the host encounters someone that's immune, they can't catch the disease and they can't then infect other people. With the seasonal flu, there are often a number of people that have immunity to the disease, either through getting a vaccine or having had the flu earlier. This reduces the ability of one person with the flu to spread the disease. However, when COVID-19 emerged, it was a brand new disease that we didn't have a vaccine for and no one had immunity to, meaning that every individual a COVID-19 host encountered was liable to catch the disease and then pass it on. In the absence of immunity and a vaccine, we can still rely on social distancing to reduce the spread of the disease. Social distancing can act as a form of faux immunity in a chain of infection. By removing ourselves from a chain of infection, the disease can't infect us if we don't encounter it, and we then can't spread it further to other people. Of the people that do catch and test positive for COVID-19, around 20 and 31% need to be hospitalised. This is a 10 to 15 time increase when compared to the flu, which causes only 2% of those infected to be hospitalised. Sleep well. Not too bad, yeah. Another way of looking at this is that one in every five people who catch COVID-19 need hospital care. The very important point of what then is the likelihood of dying from infection, which is, is really the, the, the critical number that we're missing, is complicated by the fact that we don't know how many people have actually been infected or at least exposed to the virus. And until we get a handle on that, we essentially don't know what you'd call the denominator. On a death certificate, you can tick a number of boxes, and if corona is mentioned, it counts as a corona death, then there would be, there would be an inflation of deaths. Obvious questions arise as to whether someone has died of coronavirus or with coronavirus. And I've noticed that most reports are quite careful to use the word with rather than of. But I would say, of all the things we can measure, it's quite difficult to argue with the fact that someone has died. And, uh, and if they certainly have tested positive coronavirus, that gives you some sort of, I think, valid number against which to calibrate the sort of models that we use to try and connect pattern with process. The World Health Organization reports the crude mortality ratio of COVID-19 as being between 3 and 4%. While this may sound small, this is actually 30 to 40 times worse than the flu, which has a mortality rate of 0.1%.
about 30% of hospitalized patients in the UK have died from COVID-19. And when we compare that with what's happening in hospitalized patients in other countries, it does seem to be a little bit on the high end. And it does concern me about why patients in the UK are faring a little bit worse after they get into hospital. Additionally, the mortality rate for COVID-19 varies across age groups. For those who are older, the fatality rate can skyrocket. According to data from the Institute of Social and Preventative Medicine, at 60 to 69, it rises to 5%. For 70 to 79, it rises to 10%. And for those aged between 80 and 89, the fatality rate rises to 15 to 17%. We know there's a big difference in mortality rates between very old people and between younger adults. So, for example, in Singapore, they have more than 10,000 cases now, but almost all of those are in migrant workers who are very young and very healthy with almost no severe disease, no mortality. And when you compare that with a place like the UK or, or Canada, where there have been a lot of outbreaks in elderly homes, that means there's a lot of cases in the elderly who are very frail and vulnerable to COVID-19 and the mortality rates would be higher. The figures jump for patients in critical care. It's not clear that the virus is attacking the heart or the, the kidneys or the other organs. It may be the inflammatory response of the patient. So the patient gets the viral infection in their lungs, their immune system reacts to it, in some cases with really a very strong immune reaction. And it's that immune reaction which then triggers the damage to the heart or the kidney or the other organs. So it's not the virus itself but it's a consequence of the viral infection. And that's maybe acting in combination with underlying medical conditions where the heart was weaker or the kidneys were weaker. And then we've seen that the virus is able to have a knock-on effect, which, which really does a lot of health damage. Last week, the ONS published some data which showed that, for example, if you're a man in the 10% most deprived areas of the UK, you're six times more likely to die from coronavirus than if you're a woman in the 10% least deprived areas. So, you know, there's a big poverty divide in terms of how it's impacting people. An audit by the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Centre found that of nearly 3,000 critical care outcomes, 1,500 patients died, showing a 50% mortality rate. Every day, countries are publishing data on the number of infections, the number of deaths, the number of tests. But each one of those countries is doing it in a slightly different way. You know, the UK obviously famously for us only last week or so started counting deaths in care homes and in the community to our overall death count, whereas before it was just for hospitals. Now that is very different to what, for example, France is doing where they've counted more deaths in different scenarios uh, for a while. And all of those things, if you don't understand that, could make you think that France is dealing with it worse or better than the UK. It's very important for us to be able to understand all of those nuances in what is ultimately, you know, a scary time for a lot of people. One way we can reduce the spread of infection and by extension reduce fatalities is through testing. What we've been trying to do in our research group is to try and develop a test that is an antibody test that tells you whether you've had the virus from detecting antibodies in your blood. And that's pretty conclusive in terms of telling you whether you've been exposed. And with that data, one could start to try and answer some of the outstanding questions. But that too has problems and not everyone may make antibodies. Some people may be so resistant to the virus that they simply don't get infected at all. So there are all sorts of caveats there as well. So one has to make do with the blunt tools that we have at our disposal. South Korea is a country that has set an example for how testing can impact the amount of cases in a country. In late February, South Korea experienced a sharp rise in coronavirus cases. By February the 29th, South Korea had the largest outbreak of COVID-19 outside of mainland China. But as time went on and cases continued to rise in other countries, the cases in South Korea levelled off. This indicates that Korea managed to curb the spread of the virus early on. In 2015, South Korea experienced a MERS outbreak, which led to 186 cases and 36 deaths. This originated from a person who developed a fever and travelled to several health facilities for a diagnosis, which made it difficult to track who the host had been in contact with when they were eventually diagnosed with MERS. 
Authorities didn't know who was infected or where they'd been. South Korean authorities were then able to apply the lessons learned from MERS to the outbreak of COVID-19. Health authorities developed a test for the coronavirus early on and produced thousands of test kits to distribute to hospitals in the country. Now, there are over 600 locations across the country that can screen over 20,000 people for COVID-19 every day. The UK has ramped up its testing capacity significantly. There's over 40 regional testing centres now. We've in total done over a million tests. But it's fair to say that we were late to the game compared to like Germany or South Korea. Those are the two big examples of countries that already had like a big infrastructure in place to be able to ramp up testing quickly. And that's meant, for example, Germany has had significantly fewer deaths. Additionally, in response to the MERS outbreak of 2015, South Korea changed their law to allow the government to collect patients' security footage and data during potential outbreaks. This data collection has allowed South Korea to effectively contact trace potential catalysts for an outbreak. The data, which includes information such as where that individual's been recently, is then shared, which allows the populace to stay away from potentially infectious areas. This vigorous testing and contact tracing has allowed South Korea's cases to level off, while infection numbers elsewhere have continued to rise. This trend is also seen outside of South Korea, where Germany's death rate from COVID-19 is much smaller when compared to its neighbours in France and the UK. This is attributed to higher levels of testing that were rolled out in January in Germany. In spite of the lack of vaccine, the responses made by both South Korea and Germany show us that investment in measures that allow us to manage the infection are an effective way to combat the outbreak and reduce the spread of infection. Despite its global presence, we still know very little about COVID-19. We remain in the dark over the long-term infection rates, and there's concern that the disease could become seasonal, like the flu, there's no conclusive research on recovered immunity, and some reports suggest that people might have been infected twice. Quite often what happens with many of these viral infections is that a reinfection does not cause as much disease. The severity may be reduced, and also that it may affect your ability to transmit. So if you have immunity that prevents transmission and disease, then actually it doesn't matter whether you get infected. <laughs> Through testing, we can identify where infection hotspots are and are better able to contact trace the disease. And by social distancing, we can be more effective at preventing its spread. Without a vaccine, it may be our reliance on these measures and how strictly we adhere to them that spell the difference between an outbreak that's contained and one that's here to stay.